Ace, how y'all doing? Yes. My name is Soul Expression. I'm Tensi. We are a fool child and we are freedom, freedom seekers. seekers. And we have an extra special guest today. Today we have the master teacher himself. You see your uh, hotel on deck. Yes, he is the CEO and co-founder of Yoga Skills. And we are super happy to have this space with him, this time with him today. And uh, before we get into this episode, as you guys know, this is a wellness Q&A show mm -hmm. for a freedom lifestyle. So we'll be diving into the questions that have been submitted. And if you're watching this, whether this is live or the replay. If you have questions or stories that you'd like to share or you want to further the conversation in any way, just go ahead and drop uh, you know, a little about yourself and your, your question in the comments below, and we'll continue the conversation in the comments. All right. Yes. And we might, you know, we might, uh, just, uh, put your question in the next episode as well. Right on. So I'm going to go ahead and share just a little bit about Yasir. Um, so Yasir Rahotep is a master instructor, a master instructor of yoga and the creator of the yoga skills method. He is the most senior instructor of Kemetic Yoga in the United States with over 42 years of experience uh, practicing, teaching, mentoring. Uh, Yasir was involved with the original research and documentation of ancient Egyptian or ancient African or Kemetic Yoga along with uh, Master Instructor Dr. Asar Hapi in the 1970s. Uh, he's trained and certified thousands of instructors across the globe um, with the Yoga Skills School of Kemetic Yoga. And, of course, he conducts historical, cultural, and spiritual tours in Africa, in Latin America, in Australia now, right? Also Australia? Yeah, Australia, New Zealand. Um, yeah. New Zealand, yes, all over the globe. So wherever you are, even in the U.S., he also has um, certification programs and and workshops. Treats. Yes, even uh, festivals, yeah. solo yoga festivals um, throughout. So be sure to, to check those out if you ever have a moment, which you should always have a moment. Um, <laughs> he has continued his research and uh, documents expands on the foundations of Kemetic Yoga. He's integrated um, different uh, wellness practices such as Qigong, um, such as uh, wellness in terms of nutrition, in terms of um, energy healing, chronic healing, the ancient art of movement, of course, and, breath and yoga, breath work, mm -hmm. etc. So it's not just the yoga itself. It goes well beyond it. And, um, of course, if you know about Yusir Rahotep, you probably have seen him on TV, on ABC, NBC, CBS, on the Oprah Winfrey sh uh, show, etc., on all over the interwebs as well. <laughs> so, please say hello to Brother Yasir Rahotep. How you feeling? Yes. I'm doing excellent, Hotep. And Yay. thank you for uh, having me on your show. Of course. We're happy to have you. Yeah, yeah. so happy. So, <laughs> um, so uh, if you don't mind, uh, I guess we'll just dive right in. We got a couple questions for you. And um, uh, the first one is, what really inspired you to seek and pursue the African roots of yoga, or you could say the original like roots of yoga and, and um, divine movement uh, in the first place, because, you know, with African roots of things, there's African roots of mathematics, there's African roots of like, scientific discovery. There's a bunch of different paths you could have ended up on. Um, in the realm of the African roots of stuff we use today. So why yoga? Well, I was motivated to look for the African roots of everything because I know that um, everything, including people, come from Africa. And we know that mm -hmm. um, the world's first, um, um, oldest, the, the world's oldest known civilization is, is in Africa. We know that the first human beings came out of Africa. And so when I started to practice yoga, it would only make sense that um, yoga had an African um, uh, 
if not an African origin, at least an African connection in terms of this was something that was practiced by African people in Africa. And if you just take a logic, if the, if the people in India um, from all of the established evidence came from Africa and went to India, then maybe yoga went to India too from Africa, yeah. you know? So, you know, it's just common sense. So um, ever since I was in sixth grade, I guess I was, all, I'd always um, had a, had a knowledge of Africa because I had a teacher in sixth grade who used to read us books and um, bring us, bring, they would, he, you know, he would even bring speakers in, you know, this was in 1966. He would bring speakers in to talk about black power and, Black history, and um, he would read us books by J. A. Rogers, um, you know, um, who who is one of our great historians, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. So yeah. ever since I was in sixth, sixth grade, or even before, when I used to watch documentaries on public television about ancient Egypt, I've been aware of mm -hmm. ancient Egypt and ancient Kemet, and of the contributions of uh, Africans to civilization. And so when it comes to yoga, um, you know, um, during the time I started practicing yoga, I was around 21, 22 years old. Um, I, you know, already had this consciousness. So um, my, yeah. my teacher, you know, we, we would have discussions about yoga. And we would say, well, we know yoga comes from Africa, you know, um, but we didn't necessarily have the particular proof. And so... The King, um, the Tutank Amun, who they call King Tut, that exhibit came to Chicago mm -hmm. and we was able to see an artifact, which was the chair. Um, oh, I should have my pictures and stuff because I mean, I'm right in the creel. But um, yeah, we had, a, <laughs> there, there, there was a chair um, that was. Um, With shoe on it. Yeah, it had, um, it's actually, you know, I said identify, identify it as shoe, who represents breath, but it's actually he, H-E-H. Um, and he is similar to Shu, but he actually represents energy. He he, he represents a form yeah. a form of internal and universal energy, you know. And he also represents the idea of eternity. That's why we call it the pose of immortality because he represents eternity, you know, um, and and, yeah. and things like that. So, um, so so you know, so that that sort of solidified things for us. And over the years, um, even in, you know, even though I haven't, you know, studied with my teacher for over forty years, you know, I've continued to research. You know, I was even sort of um, tasked by my teacher to continue mm -hmm. on teaching and doing what I'm doing, and I think I pretty much have exceeded, you know, whatever he expected of me to do. You know. Um, in terms of training thousands of people around the world and yeah, I would say so. <laughs> develop, developing the system further, you know, um, discovering new things uh, from um, and, and new practices from ancient Kemet and also um, sort of magnifying the philosophy and sort of dispelling yes. some of the distorted things that some people believe about Kemet and about yoga and you know, and elucidating it on it on a on a higher level. Well, we we thank you and love you for that for that work that you're doing and have done, like you said, over forty years and run and running. Yeah, can't yeah. stop. I'm just I'm just <laughs> I'm just getting started. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that is that's beautiful. Um, I've always I've, I've also always wondered um, what got you into yoga at first like what got you serious about yoga like what what was there a specific event that kind of triggered it for you of um oh snap no this is this is it this is this is gonna be one of the things that i do for my healing like why what got you serious about yoga because people do it just like as a hmm, kind of thing most of the time well, I, I evolved into yoga. Yoga was part of my um, searching for um, a health and, you know, I was, I was searching for um, increased ways or new ways to increase my health and wellness status. So before, mm -hmm. before I even got into yoga, before I was even interested in yoga, before I even knew what yoga 
actually is. I had became a vegan. I was I was actually a fruitarian because I I stopped eating mm -hmm. meat, dairy, everything, and I couldn't even eat cooked vegetables because I didn't know how to cook, and so I couldn't I couldn't I didn't know how to prepare a vegetarian meal. So yeah. all I would do was just eat fruit. I would eat nuts. I would eat seeds and raisins and stuff, and I would drink herb teas and juices, and um, and I would I, I, and I got into running. So I would I would run every day. I was reading books by Dick Gregory. I would run, do calisthenics and stuff, and I would I did that every day very intensely. And at the time I was in college, and so um, I didn't know anything about yoga. Um, I knew a little bit about martial arts. So I would practice that a little bit, but then I had I met a young lady in while when I was in college, and she um, kept trying to get me to go to this yoga class with her. You know, mm. and so I was like, well, you know, I don't want to do no yoga, you know, because I was thinking <laughs> yoga was like this. That's for women. This weird. <laughs> I didn't women. think it was for women. I just thought it was like some weird stuff, you know. Like my idea of the yoga class is that I would see this little. Indian man, real skinny, wearing a little diaper and sitting up there, you know, chanting and stuff, you know. So when I got to the yoga oh, class, okay. it was a brother. It was on the west side of Chicago, which is like, you know, like the hood, you know. And the brother was yeah. um, six five, well built. He had, um, you know, a beard. He was very masculine, and um, but he was smooth at the same time. And he could do all these movements, you know, that, you know, he could do almost any pose that you can imagine. And I couldn't do anything. The only thing I could do was the mummy pose, would just lay down on the floor. <laughs> lay down. <laughs> do like this. Yeah. And I could do a headstand on the first day. But from just doing the mummy pose and doing the class that I did, I mean, I mean like I, I did other poses, but I, you know, but I, yeah. I didn't have a lot of flexibility. But I could right. feel the difference in my body. You know, yes. and I could feel like this is something that was going to be beneficial to me. So in the first class, my teacher, Dr. Azar Hapi, he told me that he used to have a lot of different issues with his body and that he had corrected those issues through practicing yoga and that he was stiff. He said he had um, misalignment of his spine and he had mm. problems with his knees and he had corrected all those issues with his body doing yoga. And so I said, well, if he can break through that stiffness and that resistance in the body by doing yoga, I said, I can do the same thing. I said, he's, he's a brother from the west side. I'm a brother from the south side. So there's no video yeah. difference between us other than he applied himself. I'm going to apply myself. So after that first class, I would practice every day for 8 to 12 hours a day. And I just sacrificed all the other stuff that people at that age do. And I would, I would, I, all I did was go to school and, and practice yoga and go to sleep. That's all I did. So you were sold off one class, huh? Yeah, at, at the one class, I can, see the, I can see the benefit. I was 21, yeah. 22 years old, and I was telling myself, I'm going to make this investment in myself. I'm going to sacrifice mm -hmm. all this BS you know, I'm not going to know. I, I wasn't going to no parties. I wasn't going to no, um, you know, disco this. You know, that's when disco was was really right. strong, you know. And uh, I, I said, I'm not going to do none of that stuff. I'm not going to no clubs. I'm going to practice yoga. I'm not going to go drinking and stuff. I'm going to practice yoga. I'm not going to snort no cocaine or free bass like everybody was doing. I'm going to practice yeah. yoga. I'm going to breathe and I'm going to study and do my research. Because I said um, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years from now, I want to still be at a, at a robust level of health and vitality. I don't want to be broken yes. down or be dead the way that so many people are when they get into their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s or they, even if they make it that long. So I want to mm -hmm. I wanted to be at the same level of vitality in my in my um advanced years from a chronological perspective as I was in my earlier years. And so I was looking at age as simply being a chronology. Age is not age you got biological age and you have chronological age. And so chronologically you may be a certain age, but biologically, if you eat right, 
and you do you, you do these internal practices, you're going to remain healthy and robust. It doesn't make any difference what your chronological age is. You can be 21 yes. when you're 65 or when you're 85 or when you're 105. You can still have the yes. internal organs and systems of somebody who's 21 or even better. Yeah. You know, so. It's simple. Yeah. It's simple. It's it always really simple. It is. And that's wild because <laughs> whenever I first started, like, um, practicing yoga. Yeah, myself, she started in college, too. I right. was, yeah, I was mm-hmm. not... <laughs> None of this was on the radar. None of it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't. I'm not doing yoga. I'm not a yoga person. I dancing is my exercise, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but, that is beautiful. Right well, on. Yeah, it's all. It's all to me. It's all mathematics. You know, it's like I don't have no emotion about it. I don't have no. Oh, you know, I, I really wish I could do this out here, but I I have to do this over here. You know, it's like I'm just gonna do what I need to do. Because it's going to be beneficial to me, you know, and that's yeah. it. You know, it's it's mathematics. It's like if I eat something, I'm not going to eat something that's going to be harmful to me. At least ninety nine percent of the time, I'm not. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna eat things that are going to give me something back in terms of a benefit, not something right. that's going to just you know destroy my body, destroy my health. You know, it's, and so on the on the same um, on the same vibe of of healing, maybe getting a little more scientific because we can do that on this show. Um, how does comedic yoga in particular play a role in healing, like mentally, physically, spiritually, all the aspects you can heal? How does comedic yoga like really play a role in that from like your perspective? Your whole life. Okay. Yeah. So in your way. I'm going to, I might make, some, I might make some people get mad who maybe don't do comedic yoga, do other forms of yoga. All yoga is good for you. You know, all yoga is health, b- builds your health, builds your wellness, re- you mm-hmm. know, helps you manage to manage stress. But what is sort of unique about kinetic yoga is the emphasis that it puts upon breath control and the movement and circulation of energy and life force, right? So we begin with the theory that the physical body is a manifestation of the subtle body. In other words, we have a physical body which is tangible, material, that we can touch, feel, and that we experience on an immediate level. But we also have an energetic body or a subtle body or a spirit body. So when people talk about the chakras, right, that's not part of the physical body. That's part of the spirit body. So we know that we have this non-physical aspect to ourselves. Like in ancient Kemet, they talked about the ka, and the ba, and the ku, and so on and so forth. These non-physical aspects of our being that are based upon energy, energy vibration. And so, yeah. since we know that, um, so so since we understand that architecture of our physical and non-physical selves, then we know that there's, a, there's something that connects the physical with the non-physical, and that is the breath. And so, in order to to really affect the physical body in terms of creating creating its substance and to create its balance to bring balance and to bring longevity and energy to it we have to control the breath and so in comedic yoga every time we do movements and postures we are using a breathing technique that number 1 emphasizes tongue connection. We take the tip of the tongue and we connect it to the roof of the mouth. Okay? So you have three points along the along the hard palate and we connect the tongue to one of those points. We, we usually do the middle point because that's the most, that's, that's the most that's the easiest, that's one of the easier ones of the three. And we connect it. So in Indian yoga, they, they, they use the term kachari mudra. Okay? But so, but, but we just called it um, tongue connection, and so the tongue is connected, and the other piece of it is that um, we use rule of four breathing. When we breathe, we try to divide the breath into four parts, and then we also try to draw the energy. Every time we breathe in, we draw the energy from three inches below the navel. We bring it up to the crown of the head, and we let that energy move from the crown into the middle of the forehead. 
Every time we breathe out, we move the energy through the arms into the hands and at the same time down the legs and into the feet. So if we're doing like a particular pose and we're breathing in, breathing out, we're circulating that energy. And we know that when you look at the symbols in ancient Kemet, when you look at the symbols on the walls, you see that they often have a crown. They also have a sun disc or an on the top of the head. And they have that snake in the middle of the forehead. And that snake comes up. You, when you look at the images closely, you can see that the snake is moving up from the back of the skull, moving into the, across the top of the head, and it's spiraling out of the forehead. Okay, that represents that flow of the energy, right? So that serpent energy, that is your life force. That is a symbolic way of talking about the life force, right? And so when that life force is moving and circulating, all things are possible, right? In terms of your health, your wellness, and also how you manifest things on a mental or a spiritual level, okay? The, so so we're not so 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 from a physical health perspective. Everything begins with the circulation of energy. On a psychological level, everything begins with that circulation of energy. When we destroy those blockages that exist in the energy channels, so we know that, so we know that from sciences like acupuncture, that you have these energy channels that move through your body. They talk about this in Tai Chi and Qi Gong, so on and so forth. Yeah. The ancient Kemetic text talks about them. Acupressure. So, ac acupressure, yes. acupuncture, all of those things, right? And we know all of those things have roots in ancient yes. Kemet. They have roots there, right? And so um, and so we know that health and wellness is based upon that, that flow of energy. The second part is the alignment. So when you have energetic um, movement and circulation of life force, and then you have alignment of the spinal column. So in Kemetic Yoga, all of our movements and postures are geometric. Because when you look at the paintings and the statues in ancient Kemet, you see that everything is aligned in a, you know, in a certain way. We see that there's a certain geometric perfection that is involved in every statue, in every image that you see. We know that there was a yes. ge that there's a geometric um, formula that they use to create images of the human body to portray them on the walls of the temples, which was like a template that they use, which is based upon the understanding that this is the perfected human body. And so we try to emulate those principles when we do our movements and postures, right? And so, yes. so we're using breath. And we're using alignment of the, of, the, of the spinal column. And we're using alignment mm -hmm. and release of tension out of the connected tissue and out of the muscles throughout the body. So we're doing movements and postures that, are, that involve forward bending, backward bending, lateral positioning of the spine, left and right. Lateral positioning of the cervical vertebrae of the neck. And so we're hitting all those different chakras in the body as we go through our movements and our postures. And so we put the emphasis on these things. So it's not like other yoga systems don't know about some of this information, but it's where do you put the emphasis? Most modern commercial yoga is focused on the body. We're gonna do this position because it helps with your core strength. We're gonna do this because it stretches your hamstrings. We're going to do this pose because it's going to give you the yoga butt, the yoga booty, right? So they use all these yeah. different terms. <laughs> this is for your thigh. And of course, you want to have the yoga booty, the yoga butt, the yoga thighs. You want to have all those the things. Hamstring, you want to have your hamstrings. hamstrings. But you're going to get all of those things at the same time that you are that you are emphasizing control over the breath, the moving and circulation of energy, and the building of your health and your vitality, which leads to longevity. And you and also and also the, the last thing is the stim stimulation of the internal organs. So when we do different poses and postures, number one, we're breathing, right? 
So when we expand the abdomen and contract the abdomen with the inhalation and the exhalation, it's massaging those internal organs, right? It's expanding and contracting, squeezing those organs, increasing blood circulation, breaking up congestion in the organs, okay? And so all of those things, so the organs are, the organs are um, being um, kept in a very um, high level of, of health and wellness. And then the other piece is going to be, um, you know, um, just increasing your old, your overall blood circulation. And then you got to get into the eating habits. You know, you got to get into the food. Yeah. You can't, you can't do clean, yoga. Clean, clean and cleanse. Yeah, you yeah. can't do yoga and be talking about you're going to eat some fried chicken or some pizza and stuff, you know. <laughs> You got to eat. Now you're really going to make people mad, right? <laughs> well, you know, people are going to get mad at me about a whole bunch of stuff. So I can take it, you know. But, I, but you know. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And um, I've seen people who were sick. I've seen people who had ail ailments and illnesses who have become healed because they have followed the path of comedic yoga. I've seen people who just did general yoga of this style of yoga, that style of yoga. And when they started to do comedic yoga, they say they feel a difference. They say that some of the issues that their body was experiencing, even though they was doing other forms of yoga, have went away. Because comedic yeah. yoga is a very powerful healing system and the emphasis is placed upon healing. If you want to place the Absolutely. emphasis on making your muscles strong and all that kind of stuff and giving you endurance, you could do that too. And that's very good for you. But you also want to place the emphasis on this, the health and vitality and longevity aspects of practicing yoga. Yes. Yeah, and, though, go ahead, babe. And with comedic yoga, like what you're talking about with circulation is one of the, the most key things because even before water, oxygen is that healing factor that we forget about. And mm -hmm. one thing about comedic yoga that's just so beautiful with that circulation comes like the lymph nodes get to drain that yes. lymphatic drainage right. and you get to detoxify as you're moving. Um, in addition to stimulating all those energy points. Um, yeah. So right on. Right yeah, and on. We, we, we've, we've heard similar things when uh, Tensity was teaching class um, mm -hmm. that, you know, wow, like, you guys, you guys, I like the way that you're slower and more intentional with how you teach the class versus some other classes I've been to. And I feel a, a total a difference. difference in my body and such and such and my, in my energy body. And, and, and yeah, people have definitely, um, said, said similar things to, to Tensi and to, uh, Jasmine. Yeah. Uh, we talked with Tensi a couple of times. When we first brought Kinetic Yoga to Austin, like, that first class that we ever had, we had people talking about how they were actual projecting out their bodies <laughs> yeah, during, during the, body scan. The, the mummy pose, yeah, yeah. the little yeah. body scan and, and the breathing and how they were looking around as they were doing the poses, like their, their spirit body was looking around and flying around as their physical body was doing the poses and things like that. It was just like, oh, this is a blessing. Yeah, because <laughs> like to hear that, and not to intend, right, to do that for people and to people or with people or whatever is amazing. It's just, it's, it's amazing. So, comedic yoga, uh, um, if you're sleeping on it, wake up. Okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, one last question for you. What was your original call? And this is on the side of, like, yoga in, in, uh, specifically. But what was your original call to freedom? And how has your, like, freedom journey Right. To be free from, as you said, like certain things that other people your age were doing at whatever times and even now um, transformed through the through, you know, from what it originally was to what it is today. Uh -oh. yeah. and, and when we when I'm thinking of freedom, I'm thinking of not just like uh, physically or more flexible uh, right. freedom from things like insecurity, doubt, overcoming fear, mm -hmm. uh, stress, financial things. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Freedom. Right. In all aspects of right. life. Right. I understand. So, first of all, comedic yoga and my interest in yoga from an early, you know, it was always from the perspective of liberation, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, when yeah, I talk, right. so, when I right. talk about liberation, I'm talking about 
you know, we are black people, we are Africans who were brought to America, who was enslaved, you know, so we got to look at the basic issue. We was brought here as enslaved Africans and that we were um, brought here to be the only purpose in coming here in terms from the perspective of these Europeans who brought us here was to be slaves and to be property and in order to reduce us to the level of, of simply being property, they had to brainwash us. They had to um, eliminate our consciousness of who we really are. And so yoga to me and comedic yoga in particular is a way of reclaiming your identity, right? And so as you start to reclaim your identity, you say, I am great. Number one, you study your history and you know that you descend from a great people, you, you you descend from the original human beings who were on who were on Earth. That when you look at um, Africa and you look at Kemet, you can't just look at Kemet as being like okay, this just up here in the in the northeastern part of Africa. We know that people went from other parts of Africa and populated Kemet and built Kemet to become what it is. And we know that over yes. centuries. People left out of Kemet and went to West Africa, went to East Africa, went back down into South Africa. So we know that, that, that Kemet was just uh, um, the confluence point and, uh, and the flowering of African civilization, but that it was peopled and populated by people from all over Africa, right? And so, yes. and, and so, our, so number one, we have to know our history to know who we are and we have to know mm -hmm. that we are great. So how do you do that? Your 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 um, psychologically, black people, uh, African people, African Americans, and really African people all over the world in the diaspora and yes. in the continent of Africa have been damaged psychologically and psycho spiritually to one to some degree or another. Okay, and so how do we repair that damage? How do we repair the psychic trauma? of the middle passage? How do we repair the psychic trauma of simply living in a country like America or other places throughout the diaspora? You could be a Senegalese brother walking down the street in Paris and get stopped. Like the police stopped me in Paris and asked me, was I from Senegal? I said, I'm from Chicago, you know? And so they wanted yeah. to harass me because they thought, I, so they let me go because I said I was from Chicago. If I'm in Chicago, the police stop me. I might have to tell them I'm from Senegal so they can let me alone too, <laughs> you know? So so, so we have all the these stressors. We have all the, these different aggressive, aggressive moves made against us, which is happening on a, on, on a, on a overt level and on a, um, sub, a subconscious level or a subterranean level, right? A covert level. And so um, we have to work with our minds. That's why the energy, moving the energy is so important. That's why going into the, um, the, the mummy pose, or as we call it, the sahu pose, is so important. That pose is deep relaxation. So in, in Indian yoga, they use the term, um, what's that? Um, Subhasana. No, the, it's, a, it's another one. Um, nidra, yoga nidra, right? Where you just go into sabasana for like 30, 45 minutes and you just work on deep relaxation. In ancient Egypt, they used a term called resut quid. That's R-S-W-T-Q-W-E-D, right? Resut quid. That means to be asleep while awake. So the symbol is an eye an open eye resting on top of a bed, okay? So that means that even though I am asleep, I am awake. That is, a, that is another way of saying meditation. That's another way of saying deep relaxation. That's another way of talking about lucid dreaming, to be actively awake and conscious even when you're in the deepest states of relaxation, okay? And yes. so, and, and so, when we, when, when, when we are able to train ourselves to get into that state, healing can take place on the deepest levels of our being, on an energetic level and on a genetic level. That's when that stuff kind of happens when, you, when you're in deep relaxation too and then you got your phone and it yeah. goes off and you got to keep yourself, <laughs> you, you got to make that choice. It's like, 
like, oh, do I look at my phone and break my meditation or do I, do I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. yeah, well, I had to, yeah, I had that, to get rid of that. I don't really know. sparked something when you, when you were talking about that. Mm-hmm. I got a, I got a little, uh, yes. Okay, so when you, when you were speaking of, but um, that state of, alertness that state of being awake and conscious even when your physical body might be asleep or your eyes might be closed um in in that state when you were when you were speaking on that that made me think of even waking up to the dream of reality waking up Mm to um realizing that you're you're not you're not this body Really, um, that's not really who you are because when it leaves, you still are here. Yeah, or um, at least you're not limited to this body. Yes. This body is a small, maybe 3% aspect of your true potential. Right. <laughs> well, our, our meditation, like we call it Journey to a Mentor, right? That's the name of the CD or the audio guided meditation that we have. So um, that, 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 uh, that state of a mentor, right? Because we have to like look at the underlying symbolic meaning and the metaphysical meaning behind certain um, ancient Egyptian or comedic concepts like a mentor. So the, the Egyptology is, Egyptology is going to say a mentor is represents heaven, but we know that a mentor really represents the highest level of consciousness that we can achieve, right? And so how do we achieve yes. that? We have to go deep within the self. How do we go deep in, deep within the self? We have to go into the breath. We have to allow our breath to take us into that deep state. So that's why the technique that we use is very, it's not very, very important. It's essential to have the right yeah. technique. So you can't just say, breathe in, breathe out, or just inhale, exhale. You know, you have to really know how to really control the breath and take it deeper, you know. And so that's, and so that's what we do. So, um, so healing has to take place in order for you to know who you really are. So you have to go deep and you have to release. So breathing is important, right? Because when you breathe in, you're trying to take in this good, positive healing energy into your body and into your spirit body. When you breathe out, you're trying to release the tension. You're trying to release the trauma. You're trying to release the negative energy that may have come into you on a physical level that is stored within your spine and other areas of your body within your organs and also um, um, on, a, mm. on an energetic level, right? And so when we do our movements and postures, we are releasing tension and trauma from the spine. That's why when people are doing comedic yoga, a lot of times that they're taking it very slow and they're really lengthening out Sometimes they start to cry. They start to emote. They tr- they start to become emotional because they're releasing that trauma. We walk around all day long and we absorb different it's traumatic like, things yeah. that we shove down into the subconscious because we because we dealing with stuff every day. And so and and, and, and so right. we're not trying to be conscious of all these things. The the mind has the tendency to put things that it doesn't want to deal with or that it can't deal with at the moment into the subconscious to store it to, to, so that, you know, that, that's a coping me- mechanism. And so, but, but, but when we accumulate those things, you know, they stay within us and they actually affect us on the genetic level. They affect the DNA, they affect the chromosomes. And so therefore it can be passed on from one generation to the next. Kinetic yoga, because of the technique that we use, you know, we use best practices in, in terms of what yoga is really supposed to be about. And mm-hmm. it, it goes deep into that deepest levels of our being to bring about that healing, to bring about that transformation. You know? Yeah. And, and the, the, the beautiful thing about, about that connection, right? Yoga points to unity and unity has a couple of different ways. One could look at it, but the most significant, most, um, ancient and and uh and most true way to look at it in my opinion would be unity consciousness and not unity consciousness of mankind but of the whole universe Mm -hmm. because what exists in oneself is of course everything you experience in life which would be your whole universe or the universe from your perspective and your awareness 
Yeah, well, so definitely, definitely. Well, 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 yeah, well, um, yeah, that, that was, what you're saying is absolutely, absolutely correct. And what it reminded me to say is that, um, you know, the system that we live on, I always use the, the metaphor of the Matrix, right? So everybody familiar with mm. the movie The Matrix came out in 1999 or something right. like that. One of the and, greatest movies ever, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, one I of love the greatest it. movies ever, yes, for sure, for mine too. You know, <laughs> I, like, I like the whole trilogy. But, Same. Um, but the whole idea, if people watch that movie, they should go back, to, I think, in the second movie um, where Neo is talking to the architect, right? Yeah. The architect is breaking down what the matrix is, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we are actually, and also in the, in the first movie where um, Morpheus is explaining to, to Neo what the matrix is, and he realizes that all of his life is, has been nothing but a virtual reality that has been mm -hmm. pumped into his consciousness, you know? In a sense, mm -hmm. you know, so the matrix is a metaphor for the society that we live in now. So we live, we live in, an, in an illusion, right? And so when we start to practice yoga, we start to practice meditation, it's really a, a very subversive, it's, it's just like looking beyond and underneath the matrix to see what reality really is. And so when you really start, so when you do real yoga and when you do real meditation, it's gonna make you, it's gonna allow you to know that this is some bull crap, that this stuff ain't yes. real, and you're gonna wanna break out of this stuff. And so yes. that's when you're gonna begin to get on the path of self realization and self actualization. actualization yeah. So self realization is understanding what is my true nature. I am not this battery, I am not this energy source for the system that's living for the system. You're not living for the city like Stevie Wonder was talking about living for the city. <laughs> but you're not living for the city. You're living for, you know, for life. You're living for yourself. You're living, you're living for you're you, living you, for you your are nation. life. You, you are, are life. life itself. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and you're free right now. Yeah. Whether and, one believes and, it or not. And you yeah, want to become definitely. free. And so comedic yoga was developed as a tool to help to create that reality for people, to help people to create that reality for themselves. And the other part, self-actualization, is how do I put into action my, understand, my, my newfound understanding of my true nature and what is the nature of everything? I have the ability to create my own reality, okay? Mm -hmm. How do I do that? It begins with thought. That's why, that's why people have to look at Wayne Chandler and his book, yeah. Ancient Future, with the seven laws of Tehuti. The first one is the law of mentalism that everything is a projection of the mind. But how do you project your mind? How do you project the energy of your mind to create reality? You have to have the internal practices. That's what people don't understand. They think you can just imagine things and think about things. You have to have internal practices in order to elevate that energy to send it into the universe to make that energy have a stronger um, power, right? It's just like, yes. it's just like if, if I'm listening to the black radio station in Chicago, which is a great radio station, but when I get so far away in my car, it starts to get static and stuff because the signal yeah. is not strong enough to reach out that far. But if yeah. I'm listening to some other station, I can drive all the way to Atlanta and I can still hear that station on, the, on my radio because they have a different, it's operated on a different frequency and on a stronger transmission. And so you want your body, your body is both a receiver and a transmitter. Yep. And so your thoughts are gonna have more power when you elevate, when you up the, the frequency of your transmission that you're sending that thought into the universe with. And you cannot do yeah. that just by thinking and being, you know, just doing some little passive blase type of stuff. You gotta do some real, powerful type of internal energy work and that's what kinetic yoga is to me because mm -hmm. because because we look for the best practices not just doing anything but what is the best practices that's why you know that's why um you know we say that um you know you you know you you can you can compare this and that but everything has you know there's quality you know we we call it quality assurance everything 
that you do. You could do something sloppy. You could do something that's mediocre. Or you could do something that's really strong and that's really powerful. That's why we try to get people to have an adherence to our system. To like say, I'm going to use rule of four breathing, geometric pro progression, and tongue connection. You can't leave out the tongue connection because it's so it's because it makes you so much more powerful than just doing yoga and doing this type of breathing, that type of breathing without having the tongue connection. <laughs> Work. So a quote, a quote that I was reminded of is that because um, you were talking about not not only right doing no, not only knowing the practices, not only doing the practices as practices. But uh, aligning oneself with the energy of what I would call goodness. I would just call it goodness because, like I said, I, I, I know on a gut level everything is very simple. And so one, you know, one thing I was reminded of is, is goodness doesn't change. Goodness, like godness, is very consistent. It is, is, is the constant in, in life. And so you don't change goodness to fit your bubble you align. And when you align, uh, goodness not only comes to you because you're on that frequency and you're able to receive, but you also produce goodness in your in walking down the street in your everyday activities. So yeah, yeah uh, you know, one doesn't, one doesn't change and create love. One aligns with love. One doesn't change and create goodness. One aligns. And, uh, I'm, I'm with that a hundred percent. Uh, so, Really quick, we're gonna go ahead and and, uh, and switch some flip gears. the script a little bit and <laughs> and get into some of these questions that people submitted. Okay. Um, for for today's episode, so um, as you know, it's like on our on our show, we go we go everywhere where we go, you know, uh, into the depths of quantum physics. Sometimes we go into the depths of creating one's own reality, and we also speak on what we teach in Kermetic EIO, which is, you know, aligning yourself with these higher vibrations and higher frequencies. And so the first thing someone said they were having challenge, challenges with is creating abundance. And uh, I would just like to say on that same note, on that same tip, one doesn't create abundance in that way that, that it's like you make something that wasn't here before. But abundance is all around you. I mean, you, every time you breathe out, the breath comes right back. Why? Because abundance. Because abundance is, is here. It's here now. And one's belief is the only thing. The only thing that's posing as a roadblock. Yeah. Posing, I like how you said posing as a roadblock to one's own abundance. And so to create or to uh, actualize uh, abundance into one's life, one doesn't create anything like make a new but you align yourself with the abundance that's all around you. I mean, we walk on the oil and the gold and the minerals as we go down a city street. We, we you know, we, we see that, that um, you know, abundant nature of, of the greenery of the planet, of the fruits and the vegetables and the trees and everything that grows. All of these grains of sand look the same, yet all of them have a unique crystal structure. There's no two grains of sand that are unique. There's no two flakes of snow uh, because everything comes in abundance. And so. So we want to see what your perspective, your perspective on, yeah. on abundance and how to create abundance. Uh, are there steps um, that will <laughs> lead you to it? It seems yes. like there's never a true um, set thing that works One all size the time. Fits all, you know? yeah. Well, I, 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 what are your thoughts? I understand what you're saying about belief, right? You have to believe something. But this is this, this is what the problem is. And I'm going to quote uh, one of my, my friend and my teacher, Wayne B. Chandler, again, right? Author of Ancient mm -hmm. Culture. So one of the things that he said, I'm going to paraphrase, it said that you can, you know, you have, you have a lot of people talking about abundance and talking about, um, you know, creating, creating their own reality. But deep inside of themselves, they don't really believe that they can really do it because they haven't gone deep enough into themselves to really start to make that internal change take place. 
So we mm. talk about a whole bunch of things on the surface, but have we really gone deep enough in terms of um in terms of in terms of discovering our true nature, right? And so it goes back again to practices, right? Your practice has to be of a certain quality that it allows you to go deep enough and to make that and to make that connection and to change those internal frequencies within you, within your mind, within your synapses of your brain, within your consciousness that are really holding you back. So a lot of times people are being held back from really, a, from really becoming um, what they really want to become because they haven't gone deep enough and because they have been, and because they may just be thinking so you so like back back in a, some years ago you had Oprah and you had all these people talking about the secret right and so they had, yeah. and so they started a whole marketing campaign and they created something called the secret and they sold books and videos and workshops and seminars and all kind of stuff right but i don't i didn't see none of these people you know and some of these people I actually know, you know, I know personally, right? But I didn't see none mm -hmm. of these people really talking about the practices that you really need to do in order to go deep inside and to access that true power that's inside of you, right? And so, again, it goes back to how do you practice meditation? Do you just practice this sort of like, I'm just going to sit here and try to make my mind become clear and relax? Or you're going to really do, you have to do the breath work. The breath work is the key to everything. Like they have this, they have this meditation, they call it transcendental meditation, right? TM. And they say, oh, everything is so simple. You're just going to give you a word. You just meditate on that word and then the whole universe is going to change for you, right? You know, um, they say you don't have to change your diet. You don't have to breathe. You don't have to do no yoga movement. You just think about this word, right? And so they, mm -hmm. they oversimplify things, right? You have to have some internal energy practices. We see it all the time. We see people are creating abundance when they start to do the right practices. You have to, you have to meld the right practices with the desire and with the um, other things. Your diet yeah. is important, you know, um, of course, a person can become successful and they can acquire a whole bunch of different wealth and things like that, whatever, the, whatever you want to call abundance. Abundance is not just having material things, though. Abundance is where's your health, right. where's your wellness, right? And so you're going to have a better yes. opportunity to acquire real abundance. You can see one of these rappers, you know, I'm not, not putting down rappers, but you can see somebody who's like, Oh, um, I've gotten rich off of hip hop and stuff, right? And they just going to the club yeah. and they doing all this different stuff. I they do they really have abundance? You know, they're not really having abundance because they're not really practicing health and wellness. They got some cigar, they got some crystal, whatever. What kind of what kind of right. champagne they be drinking? I don't know the name of that stuff, you know. But they got this, that, and the other. And I, I, I got you, yeah. yeah. And they're not they're not really living. So abundance has to be a different thing. So abundance is your health, number one. Abundance is your spiritual consciousness and your self-satisfaction and your attunement to yourself. And mm -hmm. that, al that allows you to do the things that you're talking about in terms of aligning to, um, al aligning to, um, to, to the reality of what's out here, right? Aligning to love, aligning to um, that, that self that, that self that self awareness, yeah. But you still have to have the right. Yeah, for, for simplification, I just call it goodness. I just call it aligning yeah. with goodness because right. goodness, right? It's 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 simple yet complex. Yeah, and goodness is the breath. The most simplest thing yep. that we have is the breath. It's all around us. Shoe, hey, it's all just the breath. It's just a one syllable word. Shoo, you know, he, h e h s h u. It's just one. It's just that's a. It surrounds us. We can go for um, many weeks without food. We can go for a long time without water. We can only go for five minutes or so without air, without shoe, without the breath, and then we're gonna not um, be able to survive on a physical level. So that's the first step. That's the first place we got to look. 
We are surrounded, like you was talking about um, quantum physics, right? We are surrounded by um, um, dark energy, by dark matter, you know? Yeah. We, when, when, when we look off into space, we see emptiness except for the stars. But really that emptiness around the stars is dark matter. It's dark energy that exists oh. there. And how do we go into that? How do we acquire that? How do we use that? to create reality? How do we get the energy? That, that is a tremendous amount of energy that is invisible. And so we need to draw upon that, you know, and how do we access that power? We have to go into the breath. We have to have, you don't know, so when our ancestors, they left us those movements and those postures, they're showing us on the walls of the temples. When you go into these movements and these postures that we see on the walls of the temples, these are very straightforward geometric forms, right? And they're showing you that this is yeah. how you connect to those star systems. This is how you connect to that energy. And you have to use the breath. And they're showing us every day, but we don't even see it. Most people who call themselves scholars and Egyptologists, they can't even see that these are yoga positions. These are meditative positions. These are energy, these are internal energy practices that are pictured on the walls of the temples. So that's what we got to go back yeah, to. And, we, and, and uh, you know, no um, no shade, but we know where the, where the um, uh, origins of Egyptology come from. And it's not true knowledge seeking, but we don't got to go into it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's but the, but the it's Egypt more, you know, storytelling than yeah, the, actual, the, the, um, yeah. Yeah, but the Egyptologists, they originally was telling the truth. The, the, you know, they, they originally was talking about Egypt. They, they said Kemet or Egypt was African, they was it's black a, people. I mean, that really started to get on TV. Yeah. Yeah, but then, but then it changed. They flipped the script yeah. for, for various reasons. That's a whole other conversation, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 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 uh, next Second one. Second question mm -hmm. um, that we got submitted was uh, pertaining to plant-based diets and specifically transitioning children into plant Based diets. We had someone having and wanted um, some sort of uh, insight on how best to help transition their children into being more healthy and uh, having more nutrition in their in their lifestyles. So um, we don't personally have children, <laughs> uh, but I mean, just from our perspective, from being kids at some point. Um, for me, uh, what I would say to that is starting off with something as simple as in incorporating some of their favorite, uh, favorite fruits, favorite vegetables, uh, starting to explore different things. You can start with something as simple as smoothies. Everybody likes smoothies. Everybody likes smoothies. Everybody loves smoothies. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and kind of go from there and just my, substitute mm -hmm. my take favorite, sorry, they, you're good. take your favorite recipe and substitute out the meat and the dairy for the plant-based alternatives. And my short little tidbit add to that is if it's not in the house, they can't eat it, depending on how young they are. And if it's children that we're talking about 16 year olds and 17 year old, they got their own car. Um, if it's not at your house, then they can't eat it when they're at your house. <laughs> so, you know, eventually with the teenagers, you know, we're going to have to let them go and they're going to have to learn on their own. Some, uh, something I would say all the time is some kids need to touch the stove to realize it's hot. Right. So, uh, but, but if it's not, uh, have it and it's not, a, a, you're not keeping anything from them. It's just not here. And especially if they're little, like if you invite yeah. them into the kitchen and make it like a fun thing to mm -hmm. to play with different plant based recipes to make something together, um, then that could be like a, a, a open door for them as well. See, that's why we need the woman because I'm not creative at all with mine. I'm like, look, if this now if it's not here, it's not here. Cause. She said, "We gotta make it fun." I like that. I like that. I like her. Yeah, everything, got, everything got to flow through the women, man. You know, you know that. You know, we wouldn't be nothing if it wasn't no women. Wouldn't be nothing. They, they're the foundation of our culture and our whole civilization. Everything is based upon the sacred feminine. 
And that's yeah. why we need people like Tinsy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but yeah. what say you? Well, I say the same thing that you all are saying. Um, what I would say in addition is that um, we have to develop, we have to help children. We have to start with a theoretical foundation first, right? So we have to we have to help children to develop an ethic of wellness, an ethic where they put yeah. a value on eating healthy and being healthy. They have to see a value in it, right? And it has to become part of their ethical and their moral makeup that I, you know, it, it's immoral for me to eat food which is going to be harmful to my body, almost, you know. So, um, so how do you do that? Um, number one, like, you know, like, like you said, you got to teach them things that's going to be fun. So, yeah, making smoothie. Number one, starting off at the earliest age possible. Yes. Doing something with them that's going to be fun. So they like, you know, they like sweet stuff. So you start off with fruit, start off with smoothies, um, things like that. Oh, yeah. Help them to uh, allow them to participate in the creation of, 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 of food. You can make snacks, um, and this is all things that I've done. I've raised, I've raised um, my children. My children was raised as vegan, right? Um, and um, so when I worked with children and I would go into the projects and I would get a bunch of kids, you know, and we would get a blender, we would get some, um, you know, some fruits and stuff, and we would make like, different little snacks so you can like a simple snack that you, you can get some apple some peanut butter and stick some raisins you know put some apple slices or some celery slices put some peanut butter and stick some raisins on top and they call it they call it ants on a log or something you know yeah. you know just something really simple and get kids to start to eat these things right um um, and, and, and to make the smoothies, to participate in making the smoothies, let, it, let them see how they feel different when they eat yes. a smoothie and they, and they, the smoothie got some bee pollen in it and it's got some moringa in it or some spirulina in it. And you got the strawberries and blueberries and, and pineapple and all that stuff. You blend it all up together and it tastes good and it makes them feel good too, you know, and you have to educate. Yeah, what it, you just said, I wanted mm -hmm. to highlight it real quick, uh -huh. um, talking about how getting them to expand on how it makes them feel, starting to observe the effect that the food has on their body from their own perspective. Yeah, which expands their awareness. Right, yeah. right, because, you know, like, so, and you're also going to be combining your yoga with the kids, right? I mean, with, 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 with what the kids eat. So they're going to become more aware through their practice of yoga, doing a little simple child pose, you know, pyramid child, what we call um, Merkut Mesu Hiru, you know, doing a simple pyramid child pose with the kids. Let them, learn, let them feel what it's like to be relaxed and stuff, you know, and then combine that with eating the proper foods. And you want to slow, and so you can slowly wean them off of the, um, processed foods and off the yeah. and off the um, unnatural, artificially sweetened and flavored yeah. and preserved um, type of candies and sweets and stuff, and you can gradually transition them into more natural things. You know, um, yeah. But it's but it's oh, but it's hard work because you got to also take into the account that number one, um, you know, you got peer pressure, like um, what you were saying about going to other people's houses and stuff you know, or, or they go to school and they see the other kids eating this and then um, you 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 are um, telling them to eat this healthy stuff and all the other kids are eating this unhealthy stuff, right? And so that's... But a, the funnel cakes taste good. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's another reason about being involved in your community from a, com from a community level and being involved with... Um, um, from some some level of, of politics where you get policies changed, you know, um, where you work with your local school, if your kids go to school, you know, um, that you trying to um, get the school to change what they feeding the kids, you know, all of this stuff can be changed. You know, your money is paying tax, you paying your taxes, whether you pay them directly at the end of the year or whatever, they collecting taxes from you, they, they, they pulling your money out. And it's going to your school. You're supposed to have a say so. So don't think that you can't go to the school or be involved with the school board or be or become part of this committee or whatever 
and have an influence on what they're feeding the kids in the school. That's something that we all yeah. should do. We should be involved in the lives of our children, not just our own biological children, but the, but the lives of all the kids. So we should be involved in local politics, at least, you know, to say, I don't want this in my food. I don't want this in my, in my school. I don't want this garbage, this crap, you know. You know, um, I want to have an influence. I want to have a say so about what kids are being fed at lunchtime and so on and so forth. All of those things are things that we have power to do that a lot of a lot of times we don't we don't do because we just leave it. We just say, oh, that's them. They got all the power. I don't think none of these cracker. I'm going to just say cracker ass crackers. They ain't got no power. <laughs> we got the power. <laughs> You know, and so we should grab that power and say we taking control over this stuff. I ain't gonna let my kids just have, you know, just be inundated with this stuff. When I say my kids, I'm talking about all the children that's that's in existence are my kids. So I care mm -hmm. about all of them. You know, mm -hmm. so 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 mm -hmm. being so being active on the level of your personal relationship with your kids and how you give things to your kids and also trying to change the overall system. That's also influencing your kids because if you if if you teaching your kids to eat this healthy stuff at home, but then they go to school and they throw your healthy mm -hmm. stuff away and they start eating the junk, it's counterproductive. You got to work yes. on two fronts. You got to work on your own home front, and you got to work on the overall systematic front. And you and, yeah. and, and you can do that. And I think on the home front as well, it's it's another thing, another good thing to um bring up right some information not super early on but early on like way earlier than we already do about things like addiction to sugar and addiction to bread and addiction to starch uh because being able to discern um at, at a young age, because, you know, your parent and your uncle and your, your community is, is engaging you in, in conversations that aren't just how are you doing in school? What's your grades? Uh, do you play sports? What person do you want to be like when you grow up? But actually looking around and so that the child himself has a say as a full functioning human being, even though we know it's, it's a child. Right. So the experience level is different. But children have some of the greatest ideas ever ideified in in life so you know being being uh an enabler of having the child invent their own uh method of combating addiction to to sugar and things like that early er, early as possible you know as early as they can understand and 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 take in you know not when they're okay one years old <laughs> but you know um maybe so yeah, <laughs> learning to discern uh, between um, what what they actually want and what they think they want at a very early level, and like you said, with the with the practices with like yoga meditation, and meditation, meditation, yeah, showing them what it what the difference is in being excited and being calm yet alert. Um, and how both of them make them feel good and not just the excitement and not just the hyperness and not just the fight and fight or flight um, energy, but, but also calm energy makes one feel good way before, you know, we, we, we tell them now. We only tell them now when they're 35, but we need to tell them when they, you know, a good six to eight, you yeah. know, start having simple conversations about these things, in my opinion. Well, that, well, that's why we need people like you all to continue doing what you're doing, because we need pro, you know, we need programs to go into the schools. Like I work, I work with kids during my time. I work with, I, I, I'm going into, I was able to get contracts number one to go into um, um, preschool programs or to Head Start programs, and I've worked. Even with babies, I've taken little babies who were in um, what you call it preschool or um, mm -hmm. daycare. Daycare, yeah. yeah. And you know, just doing simple little stretches with their body. You know, that's yoga for them. You know, and yeah. stimulating their blood circulation, stimulating you know, you know, allow them to relax. Even even babies have stress. 
it's just it's and they experience stresses, especially if they like in an institution like a, a, a Head Start program or a, a daycare program because their parent has to go to work. Um, so, also when you create a program, you want to work with the teachers and the caretakers in these in these in these programs, right? Because what I have found was that when I have worked with the teachers and the caretakers, you let them experience yoga. You let them experience how it feels to be relaxed as opposed to how it feels to be in their normal state, which is stressed. You let them see how it feels to be, um, to have, a, to be nourished, to have nutritious, you let them see this, let them experience the smoothies and stuff and get the extra be complex that goes to their brain and gives them a, a, a sense of calmness, right? And so yeah. then you get them to buy into it and then they're going to say, well, we really need this for our children I, because I can see the benefit for myself as a teacher or for a caregiver. I can see how this would benefit the children. And you educate Absolutely. them on, on this stuff, right? So then they're committed to the children and we put, and we, and we, and we get the children to do yoga. We get the children to be, um, you know, to, to, to eat better with the buy-in and the support of the teachers and the other staff and the administration. So then you go to Whole Foods and you walk around Whole Foods and you see your little kids in Whole Foods with their parent. And you say, hey, I see my little kid there. And the parent is saying, oh, he made me come to Whole Foods because right. he's demanding that we yeah. eat healthy food. The little kid, the little four, five, six-year-old kid mm -hmm. is making the parent change the behavior. Yeah, you know? right. Right, and that's that's such a powerful thing. So, last last question, because um, I just noticed the time. So we're gonna go ahead to this to this last one. We're gonna bounce bounce off each other. It's no rush, but we're gonna bounce off each other, and then we're gonna close out. Okay. Um, so here, so it's a little longer. It's I'm gonna read the whole thing. My biggest wellness freedom challenge is discipline. I know what to do, but doing it consistently enough to make a difference has always been my challenge. The regret I feel after making a wrong food choice or not exercising my body is torture. I believe my inner spirit of good and is there, obviously. Um, there seems to be one that's bad as well. How can I silence the bad decision maker and listen only to the good one consistently enough to affect a healthier lifestyle that I desire? There is no bad, okay. In this okay. In, in, in this culture, we you know we you know we we, we even, even when we reject traditional religion, it still operates in us on a subconscious subterranean level, right? And so mm -hmm. we have this dichotomy between good and evil, you know, good and bad. And so there is no there is no bad. There is only good. You should always practice love for yourself. Even if you do something which is maybe not in your best interest, don't look at it as a deficit. Just look at it as something that you just recognize it as something that's a reality and something that you're going to work on in a loving manner uh, because you are a human being. Human beings are not going to be perfectly strong all the time. There is no perfect human being. So you lovingly say, I, oh, well, you know, I ate this this time. I'm going to try to do better next time, you know. Right. And, you know, and sometimes right. you just have to give in to stuff and just enjoy it. And then sometimes when you stop eating things and then you may slip up and eat it again, you may say, wow, this I, 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 I really thought I wanted this, but after I ate it, I can see my body doesn't even want it doesn't even taste the same way that it used to taste because you know with alcohol that's very popular. Yeah. People will quit alcohol and then and then like you know get a little down and they think it's going to help them out because it used to and then they take three sips and they're like I don't, I'm not even going to finish this drink. Right. And so and so that person who takes those three sips whatever they mm -hmm. shouldn't feel bad that they did that because you know like. Like, like, you know, like when I teach mindful meditation, right? So mm -hmm. we teach that um, 
if you don't feel like you relax, you don't get mad because you can't relax. You just say, oh, I'm not relaxed. So that's, you just take note. You just make a mental note of the fact that you wasn't as relaxed as you may have wanted to be. And you try to explore the reasons why you wasn't able to get relaxed. It's just an awareness thing. And, but you don't, but you never want to punish yourself. So one of the yoga skills, like the, the, the yoga that, as you all know, the yoga I teach, we have yoga skills method. Yes. And one of your yoga skills is to be loving to yourself and to be patient with yourself. It's a developmental process. You know, if, if a person was a drug addict, relapse, which means that you're going to go back into, you may stop using drugs for six months, a year, six years, and then you may have a relapse. That's natural. That's normal to have a relapse. You don't punish yourself and say you're a bad person. You just say, I'm a person who's a human being who had a relapse. But now I'm, I'm learning from that and I'm going to continue on with my process of recovery. And so foods, are most of these foods are nothing but drugs masquerading as foods, right? And so, yeah, the process, heavy process with the sugars and things, yeah. Yeah, icy pops and, you know, even some of the fake vegan meat. It's just drugs to disguise this food. So a lot of, and so what does, what do drugs do? Drugs work on certain centers in your brain. And so it's very hard to get unaddicted to these drugs. It took, when, when I first became a vegan, um, and I stopped eating meat, I stopped eating meat like that. I stopped eating beef, pork, all that stuff. But sugar, I would be at <laughs> home and I would be like, I started shaking this stuff and I had to go out I would have to get up and go out to the store and buy me a cake and some ice cream and I would eat that stuff and then I'd be like oh I feel terrible you know and it took me about yeah. a year to to make my to get to the point where I didn't have a desire to to eat that sugar because sugar was it was it's operating on certain centers in your brain you know, the same centers. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's it's an addiction, and people we need to understand what addiction is. Addiction is in your brain. It's not just, you know, like a lot of times we say, "Oh, this person is a drug addict. This person is an alcoholic," and we look down upon that person because we think that's a moral failing of that person. That person doesn't right. have enough willpower. It's not a matter of willpower. It's a matter of re reconditioning and detoxing those centers in the brain, and so that takes time. And so don't get mad at yourself, just, and, and don't think of terms of good and bad, and you got a higher self and a lower self, because there's a lot right. of nonsense that's been put out here into the conscious community <laughs> about we have a higher self and a lower self. We just have a self. There's no higher and lower. There's no good and bad. There's no sin and, you know, sin versus good or whatever, you know. We all Absolutely. are born in grace. And we should just be loving to ourselves no matter what we do. We make a mistake, still love yourself because that's what <coughs> human, de human beings do. We make mistakes. You know? Yeah, and I think that's a very, very, very beautiful and necessary answer. So definitely thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think a lot of us, we, we do. We confuse the word consistency with perfection. And then we say, I'm, I, you know, like you said, I'm a bad person because I keep making these decisions that aren't in my idea of consistency, which I've confused with the idea of perfection. But perfection includes life's mistakes in reality. Perfection includes life's, uh, you know, everything is waves, right? Everything, we could argue scientifically, everything physical that we see is sound. And sound goes like this. And so the down is just as beautiful as the up. The thing to, to do is to just keep keep your your own interpretation, perception of self at a at a at a at its at its highest potential when you can. Right. Everything is wave is wavelengths is what you're saying, you know. So you got yeah. the wavelength has a it has an apex and it has a downside and it goes yeah. up and down like that, you know. So sometimes you gotta just ride with it, you know. So yep. when, but but when you start to meditate you sort of smooth it out some. But then yeah. periodically, you know, I mean you know, periodically, you might, you know, your consistency has to be measured over years. You can't say, well, I had this one incident after six months and now I'm, I'm mad at myself. Where well, you're going to look at yourself in six years. You might have six incidents in six years, but that's good, you know? Yeah. 
you know, and that's, that's, it's, it's funny that you say that because I was, and this is on the side of like food and stuff, but I was just thinking to myself that it's, I'm, I'm still measuring me and Tensi's relationship and how good of a husband I, I am and I'm being as if we just, just got together and just got serious. Like I feel it's still the very beginning because I don't have enough, you know, time to really look back on and say, am I consistently, you know, being the man that I know that I can be uh, when it comes to this relationship. And, and it's that same, it's that same energy where I'm not worried about, okay, did I make three mistakes in the last six months? You know, if I did, then, then I'm a horrible person or something like that. No, it's, 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 what am I going to do today? You know, <laughs> well, you better not make no mistakes with Tinsy. <laughs> Tinsy is the know, empress. Right? She's the goddess. It's and so, it's, it's so, it's, it's so, it's so, um, yeah. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Empress, you know, she, 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 yeah. she, she's, she's up here. Question. She's way up here. <laughs> <laughs> this whole question of consistency and, and even, uh, the topic of addiction, um, on on the base most base of levels the is it tends to to appear in the form of we're addicted to beating ourselves up we're addicted yeah. to those um right emotions that pull us down we're addicted to the the thought patterns of uh not good enough um you have to do more in order to be uh uh, free or or good, uh, mm -hmm. it's not enough. <laughs> the chemicals of stress, we're addicted to we're the addicted adrenaline to that. that comes with the fight or flight response. We get addicted to that by the age of like seven or eight years old, and which is, I'm sorry, which is a part of the reason why we have the the running negative thought. You know, most of people you could say have running negative thoughts all day and even in their dreams because. By the time you're very young, you're already addic uh, somewhat addicted to the the chemicals of stress of being stressed out in fight or flight. Yeah, well that that yeah. That, that can begin um, in vitro when 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 uh, when when you're an embryo when you're um, but not an imp but what you call it when you're when you're being carried by your by your mother, you know you, you 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 can yes. your fetus you can already be. You can already those chemical processes that produce stress and produce all the negative effects of stress, like heart disease and stroke. You can already be diabetes. You can already be set up from that from before you even born. If your mother was experiencing that while you was in the womb, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it goes. It, it starts even further, even earlier than when you're six or seven years old. I'm, I'll tell you a story. I had a. Um, when I was working with some young kids and I was teaching at a um, um, preschool program. So this little girl was about three years old and I have, I have like a yoga ball, right? Like the big yoga ball yeah. that, and that you blow up and I have, the, yeah. And I have the little kids um, do the back bend on the ball, right? Because psychologically it, it allows them to be in a disoriented position but to, but but to still learn how to remain calm. So most of the time, you put the kids on the ball and you want them to lay back and stuff. They they act scared, you know. They act yeah. fearful and they tense up. So then your goal as a teacher is to try to get them to relax and to accept the fact that they're upside down, sort of, but they still calm within themselves, right? And th so yeah. so that's therapeutic psychologically. So I had one little girl I could put her on the ball and she would lay back and she would stay there for like. I had to, I would have to make her I would, I would have to I would have to make her get up. She can stay on there 10, 20 minutes and she would not move. She would just go into this deep meditation. So I told her mother one day, I said, you know, your daughter can really relax. Like she's really deep. And so her mother said, Well, you know, I did prenatal yoga when I was pregnant. And I guess that's where it comes from, you know. So the fact that that mother was creating um she wasn't creating stress hormones. She was creating wellness hormones and relaxation yeah. hormones and hormones that are associated with having a sense of well-being and a sense of balance and a sense of contentment. She was creating those and transmitting those to her to her um, to her fetus that became her child 
And so that child was like that, you know, as a child. So that child is going to be much more, not, not intelligent, but they're going to perform intelligently much more on an intellectual level and on an emotional level because they are in that state, because she is producing those type of hormones in the brain, those type of neurotransmitters, because our emotions and our thoughts and everything is related to the chemicals that are created in the brain, you know, and so that's a whole nother topic there, you know, but. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, with with consistency um, and not beating yourself up and even throughout whatever the pattern was, uh, however, you came into this world uh, being or uh, saved from the womb if you if you had the experience of wellness or if you had the experience of being stressed out as a baby um, throughout your life. In, <clears throat> in consistency, the biggest thing that I've taken away from my journey has been that even, even in the moments where you do feel like... Um, it's a bit much or uh, or you feel stress or you feel uh, the thoughts come of it's not good enough. What you were saying, loving yourself through it all is, is one of the, the most healing things. And one of the things that will uh, ironically help you stay consistent in the grand yeah. scheme of things, the grand scheme of things, helping you want to uh, go a little deeper and see more of yourself and love more of yourself and just not worrying about if you, it's, it's all good. If you slip up, you don't really slip up. It's all yeah. good. And I'm going to say this about um, resiliency, right? So I'm a social worker. So I was, I was, a, so I was, I've been doing social work since this, since this, um, the eighties. Right. And so I saw the whole, I was working for children and family services during the whole crack epidemic, right? In Chicago, where you had so many children being born to women who were using crack and cocaine, other types of cocaine during the time that they was <laughs> pregnant. And so all the predictions was that these children of these, they, they call them, they call them um, substance, substance exposed infants, right? So they said <laughs> that all of these children were going to have problems, psychological problems, social problems. They're, they're going to be the ones that wind up going to jail. They're going to be the ones that wind up failing in school and so on and so forth. So they're the opposite of this child who I was describing earlier, whose mother was doing prenatal yoga and eating good and creating this pot. They was putting, they was putting crack cocaine into this baby, into this baby's bloodstream. But then over the years, I know, I know, I know these people. I, I've seen my little baby that I got, you know, that I was um, involved with, who was substance exposed infant. I see this person is 20, 30 years old now. And this person is well functioning. You know, some of my students that I get who come and study um, yoga with me, or who become teachers, some of those people are the same substance exposed infants, you know, who I was working with over the years. And they, but 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 even though they were exposed to these things, that they had this very early, they had this early negative um, experience and contact right. that affected their brain development. Even they were able to overcome it by being exposed to other things later on in life. That's why the work that we right. do as yoga teachers, comedic yoga teachers, is so important. Because most people who become comedic yoga teachers, what do they do? They want to go into the community because they're operating yoga from an African perspective and an African-centered perspective, not just saying, oh, everything is just universal and I just love everybody. And you do love everybody. You do want to be in tune with everybody in the universe. You're not, you're not trying to be prejudiced or against other people, but you also enter with a sense of service to your community and to those who need it the most, you know? And so, and so when we go in, yeah. when we go into these schools and these institutions and we're teaching them yoga, nutrition, and wellness in general, and, 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 about, them, and about themselves. From an Af like, who are you as a black person? Who, what is your history prior to enslavement? You know, 
how do these things go into reprogramming the brain, rewiring the brain, and changing consciousness to allow that person to become something much better? I'm going to say one more thing. I was, yes, in, no, I, I was in Starbucks one time, and this brother, this may, be, this may be 10 years ago, this brother came up to me and said, um, he was about 50, he was about 45 years old. And he said, you was my teacher. And I looked at him, I said, um, no, I ain't never been your teacher. I said, you almost old as me, you know? So I know, I know I wasn't your teacher. He said, no, you was my teacher because um, so on and so forth, right? And so yeah. he made me realize that he was one of the kids in a program I used to work with, which was an alternative to kids getting caught to, instead of them going to jail, when they when, when when they had like three strikes against them, they went to uh -huh. our program, and I was around twenty three. He might have been seventeen, so that's that's mm -hmm. like about a six year difference, right? So so now that we yeah. both old older, you know, we about the same age, you know. Yeah. But, but he but but um but he said that he wasn't one of the kids I worked with directly, but he would look at me, he would watch me. He said I would come in every day and I would wear, I would bring um, my green juice and stuff, my smoothie with all my little green stuff in it. And I would have my fruit and I would teach the other kids yoga. And he would just observe, right? He just observed. And he, sometimes I would wear my little African hat and stuff. And so when I saw this brother, he had on like, he had on an African hat, you know, he had like a little um, kufi on and stuff, you know. And he oh, said, yeah. that, and he said that, I was his example. He said now he works, he started, he has his own business. He said he's a vegetarian. He said that he, he, he hires kids and work with kids and stuff, you know, because he was inspired to do that, not because I said anything to him, but just because he just observed me. And then we just happened to bump into each other many, you know, like decades later in Starbucks, you know. It was like an amazing yeah. thing to me. And I said, you never know what if you know who you who you are who's looking at you who's observing who's looking, you yeah. and what effect that you're having upon people you know yeah and that's why you know um all of the scriptures across the whole world from the hieroglyphs on down through the, the text that we write in english all of the scriptures say just walk the righteous path no matter who's looking at you right because uh, you never know you right. never know right. so for now we're going to go ahead and close out the episode uh and um yeah man so the, how we do it we close out the episode with a little um call, call and response. response uh so if you if you open to what you're hearing can you repeat after us please this it goes is like a this. freedom seeker mini manifesto yeah freedom seeker <laughs> mini manifesto so i create my own well-being i create my own, own well-being well i define my own destiny i define, I define my own destiny, my own destiny. I live for freedom. I live for freedom. I live for freedom. I am free to be. I am free to be. I am free to be. And, and that makes, makes us, us freedom seekers. seekers. And makes and us makes me seekers. a freedom seeker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, love, uh, Hotep. And uh, peace to you, brother. Uh, really, really, really honored, you know, Baba, uh, to have you on 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 the scene. Okay. And, um, and thank you, thank everybody you. that will watch this. Um, we'll be posting it soon. Uh, anybody that comments below, we keep the conversation going. So if anything comes up for you throughout the episode, feel free to always just put it down in the comments. Okay, now and I got I got you on, I got you on my Facebook Live too. So tell okay. me, say the name of everything, your organization, and who you okay, are. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So first and foremost, all of the information that anyone will need is on ufuluchild.com. That's www. U F U L U Child dot com and uh, our page on Facebook Ufulu Child is U F U L U space C H I L D um, Instagram at Ufulu Child spelled the same way Twitter at Ufulu Child YouTube Ufulu Space Child okay. and uh, we are a home for freedom you. seekers worldwide we 
are wellness practitioners, um, comedic yoga. I'm a comedic yoga instructor. Uh, we meditate. We have our own uh, holistic wellness program called Comedic mm -hmm. Experiential Introspective Optimization, also known as Comedic EIO, EIO inspired uh, by my mom's cancer and diabetes recovery along with my dad's recovery from uh, stroke. Okay. And uh, we just put all the all the elements together of uh, plant-based nutrition, of Comedic meditation, yoga, meditation, meditation, limiting belief transformation, herbalism, and freedom without form. <laughs> yes. I love it. And fasting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're also performing artists. <laughs> yeah, we also do, do music, poetry, and uh, sacred art, sacred art, and uh, uh, speeches and you know, stuff yeah. like that. So. Everything. Holla, 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 holla. Yeah. And uh, we're just happy to, to see y'all. Happy to be here with you. Mom, that's a teacher. That's a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very, I'm very um, proud of you all. And um, it was like, uh -huh. uh, you know, you all are two of the most dynamic people, young people that I know, you know, and um, oh, keep on doing <laughs> what you're doing. And um, I look forward to um, many more decades of seeing you all grow and grow more and into the future. So of hotel. Course, of course. And I should be coming to get my uh, comedic yoga certification late, late this year when you go either this year, when, whenever you go back to Egypt. I'm gonna try to make this 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 but go round so that, I can get my certification. On. But it, 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 you know? but that'll be that'll be in November. So if you want to, hey, I would it. I would love to have both of y'all come around and um yeah we can we can discuss that and see what we yeah. can work out. I know. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, so, thank you everybody um, yeah. for being here. All right. Peace. All right. Hotel. Peace. <laughs>